Thank you for listening to a Christ-centered message from Grace Community Church. We are committed to proclaiming the authority of God's Word without apology and trust that you will receive encouragement as we study today's passage together. God made everything and it was good. Our fellowship with Him was very good. But our rebellion shattered every relationship. Our sin brought the curse of death. We can see that things are not the way they are supposed to be. Our world is broken. We long for our redemption. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came into our world. He lived and died and rose again before returning to his Father's right hand. Soon, Jesus will return. And every eye will see him, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb slain for sinners who overcame, and he will make all things new. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Are you ready to get into our study today? Let's go to Revelation chapter 3. Today we'll be looking at verses 7 through 13. We have studied so far the letters from Jesus to the loveless church at Ephesus, the persecuted church at Smyrna, the church at Pergamum that was compromising, the corrupt church at Thyatira, and the dead church at Sardis. We looked at that last week. Now today we're going to dive into the sixth letter from Jesus through John to the church at Philadelphia, the faithful church. This, loved ones, is the church that we want to be. And in some ways, I will be honest with you, I am beyond words of gratitude to be able to stand before you and with you today and say, thank you, Lord, for the measure of grace that I'm experiencing, that I see in this letter to Philadelphia, and I've experienced for almost decades now in this congregation. Uh, it's just a joy of my heart to not have to feel like I come with, you know, the Bible as, as, a, as a bat to, come on, people, can't you see what church could be like? But that we are experiencing the goodness of God, and we can say, no, we haven't arrived, and we want to be more like this, but we're seeing glimpses of this increasingly every day. What did the Lord have to say to these believers here in the city of Philadelphia? Now, don't be confused. It's not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, all right? That came many generations later. But the name is significant. It means brotherly love, named after a man who really loved his brother. And that's how the city got its name. Now, I'm a, I am a brother, but I didn't grow up with brothers, all right? Sometimes Ginger says I'm soft. I, I needed brothers to pick on me, you know? I just had older sisters. But this is the reality. Some of you grew up with brothers. Brothers are great, but we actually, all of us, whether you are a sister or a brother or a son or daughter, we all need a friend that sticks closer to a brother than a brother. And his name is Jesus. And this is what Christ taught us, to love one another, and this is what he did. He loved them to the very end. He didn't give up on them. The ultimate friend is Jesus. And in his church, we're given this type of an enduring friendship. This should be the characteristic of believers in a gathered body. Proverbs 18, 24, a man of many companions may come to ruin. Right, if you live simply to please everybody, just to be, I want more social media likes and friends and followers. There's your verse. You come to ruin because you'll sacrifice anything to keep the followers, to keep the crowds. But 
there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. His name is Jesus. So what then would the Lord say to us as a church? That's the question I have in each of these messages. What would the Lord say if he was here and he was looking in on us and I sat down and he stood up, what would he say to us? Revelation is very pastoral. It's a pastoral letter and it's from the greatest pastor. It's from the greatest shepherd and his name is Jesus. This is the letter that would go to every church. Every church would hear what Jesus was saying to the other six churches. Keep that in mind as we unfold this portion to the church of Philadelphia. I love what we read here. And brothers and sisters, I love you. It's a joy to serve Christ with you. Amen. I appreciate that. (laughs) Revelation 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and you have kept, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God the new Jerusalem which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Again, this is the introduction, each of these letters, but the letters shift, okay? It's not just a form letter and you just substitute the name and you put the thing, and and Merry Christmas, and I just do a form letter, but I make it look personal. This is an intentionally personal, intimate letter. Now, the map will come on the screen, and we're moving around the mail route, okay? So we've looked at the first, we're uh, down to Philadelphia. Next Sunday, God willing, we'll look at the church at Laodicea. But here we are, and we see this letter is circulated. They would read the entire book of Revelation. It's a letter that the whole church would hear beginning to end, and as we said a few times now, every single church, these seven churches, would hear the consummation of all of human history and redemptive history in less than it takes most movie makers to make one movie. So whenever you're feeling overwhelmed by revelation, let let that be reversed. Jesus did in the living word of God what Tolkien couldn't do. What they couldn't do in Lord of the Rings with two trilogies. That's hours upon hours upon hours and people pay dearly for that. Endgame. All of the Marvel movies and people pay dearly and they watch it for two and a half to three hours. And Jesus wrapped up the truth, not fiction, human history, redemptive history in about an hour and 20. Let that sink in because that's what the churches would hear. The whole, this is where it's all going. And it would be at an intermission point for most long movies. Think about that. The messenger is the pastor. It's the one who brings the the good news. This messenger, he must have truly loved serving in this church. He loved the people. He loved Jesus. They loved him. They loved Jesus. They loved one another. 
They're carrying out the Great Commission. But this church would have been feeling the weight of all that they've heard when they heard the letter written to Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira. And last week, we heard Sardis and the weight. And there, there at Sardis, there was just a little ember. There's just a few that remain. And they're tuned in and they're feeling the weight of what's going on in these churches. And they're feeling the weight of their brothers and sisters who are being persecuted in Smyrna. And they're feeling the weight. And this church would have been tuned in to say, what's Jesus going to say to us? And they wouldn't have been listening in. Oh, what's Jesus going to say to us? They would have been more inclined and tuned in to say, what does Jesus have to say to us? How can we please him even more? They loved him with all of their heart and they loved one another and there's a fellowship here that we want to replicate. This church is located here in Philadelphia and they're the called out ones, it's the church. The city was about 28 miles southeast of Sardis. It was situated in a strategic place on a main route. The picture will come up and you see there's, there's even behind the city as most cities would be put somewhere near a fortress, a citadel somewhere that they could retreat to if an enemy was coming. They're in a strategic place on a main route of the imperial post from Rome to the east, called the Gateway to the East. In antiquity, the Persian royal road from Sardis to Susa, modern-day Iran, it ran right through Philadelphia. That's a lot of trade, commercial traffic. Another picture will come up of their agriculture. You can see in the location that they live, it's in the plains. There's, you know, there's a wide area. So like Sardis, they're noted, agricultural products. But here's a problem. Just like in Sardis, they were on a fault line. There were many earthquakes that came and destroyed the city. It was so much devastating that people when rebuilt they rebuilt the city a roman emperor rebuilt the city and people said thank you but we really don't want to go back in because there's so many ruins they didn't want to go back and if you remember back when hurricane katrina came to new orleans and people finally got out of the bowl and then the army army engineers they came in and reworked things and and bolstered it all up, but you remember not many people wanted to go back quickly. Like, hey, we've kind of been there, done that a couple times, and it seems like we're kind of waiting on the next storm. So I'm not sure I want to go put my life back in risk again. That's how they were in Philadelphia. So they were out, and any time there was tremors, people would run for the wide open areas, get out. There's not even very much when it comes to archaeological remains like i've had pictures of all these other cities in philadelphia there's not a lot there's not a lot at all there is a church well modern day uh it's modern day i don't know if i'm saying it right or not alasher is uh in turkey it'll it'll come up on the screen now this is just you know what the city looks like and if you can look right in the center you're going to see where a byzantine church used to be established and there are two massive pillars I mean, now it'll zoom in. These pillars are monstrous. You see a bus behind it? I mean, th these are massive pillars, but they've been destroyed. One of the earthquakes came through, the building's gone, and all we have is the pillars remaining. Does that sound familiar to what Jesus was saying to the church? Are you putting this together? That image is still there. You can Google, Google Earth. I got all these words going great today. You can Google Earth, and you can see that. I was moving around through. I was like looking at it from all different sides. This city was also known as Little Athens. There were so many temples in this city, but most of them, they're all buried. Nobody's even dug them up. This city was a missionary city. It was for spreading the Greek culture. Right there on the crossroads, everybody was coming through, and so the Greek culture was transported to other cultures around the world through this city right here a missionary city philadelphia there is a picture of a sarcophagus and right there it is right there behind in that uh, those pillars that's in that courtyard of that church and it's interesting there's just a little shack a little gate 
There's just not many people, it seems like, go visit this place. Modern day Turkey, predominantly Islam in the area. The legacy of the city is it was named for a king of Pergamum. Adelus Philadelphus loved his brother. Brother lover. He loved his brother. And this was named after him. There's still a witness to the gospel in that city to this day. This missionary church, this great commission church. The letter is from Jesus. Now it's interesting because in the introduction as Jesus uh, is unfolding here, we don't see Jesus coming with eyes that burn like fire. We don't see him coming with a sword. We don't see him uh, pictured and depicted with the bronze feet to stomp out sin. No. We see Jesus revealed as, he says, the Holy One. What is he saying here? Jesus is God. He is the Holy One. Isaiah saw that in the presence of the Lord, holy, holy, holy. Three times. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. It's a common description of the Lord found in the book of Revelation, and here it is applied to Jesus. It, it speaks to his perfection, that his holiness, it has implications for those who would be his followers if he is holy and we are to be like him. Jesus Christ is absolutely perfect and separate from sin. No church, loved ones, ever becomes faithful without being holy, set apart to the Lord. We won't experience victory that comes from Jesus until that is the focus of everything that goes on in our lives individually, personally, and corporately. Is this pleasing to the Lord because he is holy and I want to be like him? Perfection. The Holy One also speaks to his separation. That because God is holy, he is, in another spelling of the same word, holy other than us completely, entirely removed from us. There's a great chasm between us and our Creator, but that chasm was bridged when He became one of us in the Incarnation, and that is what we are celebrating in this season. We celebrate it every week. But the world actually hears the gospel over Christmas carols, and they hear this message, but most are asleep to it. He retains his scars on his body, and we'll see that in Revelation. Those scars are still there that he bears. That's how our redemption was attained. He's not ashamed of those scars. He suffered in our place. He satisfied the wrath of God on our behalf. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 tells us that. Hosea 11 and verse 9 Says The Lord says, I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man. Don't ever confuse that. Listen, sometimes you hear people say, the, the man upstairs. Do you know how blasphemous that is? Somebody trying to you know, give honor after a football game or some sporting event. I want to thank the, quote, man upstairs. God says, I'm not, I'm not like you. I don't get tired like you do. I don't have a weak back, a weak memory, weak hearing, weak vision like you do. I'm not like you. I don't forget anything. It says, I am God and not a man, the holy one in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Understand who he is. So he didn't come in wrath the first time. He came in humility, clothed in human flesh. And wrapped in the swaddling clothes, laid in a manger. And Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake, he made him, Christ, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's the great exchange. He became like us so that he could make us like him. That is the gospel in a nutshell. So he's the holy one. He's also the true one, the genuine, authentic, not a counterfeit, not idolatry, 
Not only does he speak truth, but he in fact is truth. That's what he told Pilate. I came to testify to the truth. You hear my voice? Because people who know me, they hear. And what did, what did Pilate say? What is truth? What is truth? How can anyone know what is true? He's the only authentic God. He's not manufactured. The slain martyrs in Revelation 6 refer to the Lord as holy and true. And through Jesus comes the great reconciliation. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me is one way. He's the sovereign one. He says, I'm the one who possesses the key of David. I have it. It's mine. It belongs to me. A key, it signifies power. Normally, the most powerful individual holds the key. The king, somebody in charge, unless he delegates it to another. You think back to Joseph, and what did, what did Pharaoh do? Like, here, take my ring. I'm delegating to you the key to Egypt. It's mine, but I'm delegating it to you. You're a steward. And Joseph served faithfully in that way. There's an Old Testament background to this title in Isaiah 22. The Assyrians had invaded Judah, and Isaiah had warned them about this. One of the uh, problems with the Israelites is the Jewish leaders were trusting in Egypt, not God. And they wouldn't listen to the prophets warning them, stop trusting in man. You're running after uh, an army. You're running after somebody else that looks more powerful. Put your trust in the Lord. Put your trust in the Lord. And they wouldn't listen. So one of the treacherous leaders there in Judah, his name was Shebna. He'd used his office not for the good of the people, but for his own private gain. Just imagine a politician ever doing that. Oh, wait, we don't have to imagine that. That happens quite often. Sadly, it happens in churches too. And it shouldn't. That's what he did. He was using people for his own advancement, for his own private gain. God saw to it that Shebna was removed from office and that a faithful man, Eliakim, was put in his place and said, give him the key. I give him the key of authority. I'm taking it from you, Shebna, and I'm giving it to Eliakim. And Jesus says, I have the key. Jesus Christ is here claiming to possess the keys to salvation and blessing. Whereas we read in Revelation 1.18, he holds the keys to death and hell. So to enter his kingdom, you have to bow to the king. You can't be in his kingdom and be confused and say, actually, I'm king. We've been talking about this on Wednesday nights with our students for about two months now. Who's king of your life? If you're king of your life, I do what I want to do, when I want to do it, where I want to do it. I just do whatever I want to do. That's a small kingdom, and it has a shelf life that's expiring soon. You exchange your small kingdom, you die to you in that kingdom, and that's where you actually will live forever in the kingdom without end, and it's the kingdom of Christ. He is the one, Jesus claims, who opens and closes doors. This can really be, and there's a lot of debate. <laughs> well, does he mean opening the door to the kingdom or does he mean opening, opening the door of opportunity for ministry? Yes. He has, a, he has all that. That's what he does. The Lord opens and he closes the door of entrance into his kingdom. Jesus said that, John 14, 6, I'm, I'm the only way. John 10 and verse 7, Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I'm the door. John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Pilgrim's Progress, there are those who hop the fence. They're imposters. That's what John Bunyan was dealing with is Jesus said, I am the door. You have to enter through the door. There's only one way. It's through Jesus. And the Lord, yes, in fact, opens and closes doors of opportunities for ministry. He's the one who opens doors and he closes door, doors. Acts 14, 27. Uh, Luke is writing here, recording these travels of, of the ministry of Paul. And when they arrived... 
and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them. Well, what had he done? How he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And when he opens a door, who closes it? Nobody. 1 Corinthians 16, 9, Paul says, for a wide door for effective work is open to me. Oh, and there are so many adversaries. I'm going uphill both ways here, through the snow. No shoes. Like it's awful. Paul's being serious. But the door's open, and Paul said, I'm going through. Oh, there's a lot of adversaries, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We're going through the door. Colossians 4.3, at the same time, pray for us also that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which, I still have troubles going on. I'm locked up for it. Still, I'm in prison. But pray the Lord will open it. Isn't that, is that how you would ask for prayer? Is that how I would ask for prayer? Oh, hey, I'm locked up in prison for preaching the gospel. Uh, please pray for me that I'm kind of missing my family, missing being face-to-face with my people. Open the door that the word, the gospel, would be proclaimed. Will you pray in that? That's what Paul's saying. Acts 16. How did the churches even? We're studying these churches to Revelation here, these, these churches in Asia Minor. How did they even come to existence? Right here. Because the Lord closed one door and opened another door, and Paul went another direction, and that's how these churches ended up coming into existence. Acts 16, verse 6. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. No, door closed. And when they had come to, up to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus said, no, doors closed. Don't go that way. Did not allow them. So, verse 8, passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging them, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Doors closed, door opened, and Paul said with Luke, let's go. Let's ride. Let's get there. Come on. How fast can we get there? That is all in the introduction, and there's no threat there. This is all identity of who Jesus is. Now we get to the message. The message just starts off, and like I said a minute ago, or maybe it was a couple minutes ago now, they would have been saying, what is he going to say to us? What rebuke does he have? What praise or affirmation? We want to listen. It's affectionate praise from Jesus. He says, I know your works. This comment was a com- commendation by the Lord. And he would go on in detail to tell how their faith was working in Philadelphia, that they persevered despite many obstacles. They love Jesus, they love the gospel, they love those around them. Their message was the gospel, and their motive was grace. Oh, may this be true of us. This church was a small church. He said, I know your works, you're small. You just have a little power. You're overlooked easily in the city of Philadelphia. You're not very impressive. You're not very influential by normal you know, business standards. But you're a faithful church. You're a genuine church. You're a loving church. They didn't grow large in the eyes of the community, but they sure were large in the eyes of their Savior. The churches, you know, these other churches already that we've listened to, they might have looked down on them. Ah, that little church of Philadelphia but not Jesus. He loved them. He didn't look down on them. They were a great commission church. And opposition, it didn't keep them from obedience. They knew that was a risk. Chuck Swindoll says a helpful description this way. He says the size of a congregation, the limitations of its location, or the restrictions of of its budget should never determine its vision. Instead, Churches, listen up now, Grace. Churches should set their vision based on the power of their God. God is infinite, magnificent, awesome, and mighty. Beyond all description or comprehension, when he chooses to open opportunities, the possibilities are what? Endless. All we need to do is trust and follow him. 
wherever he leads. That's a helpful summation. Oh, they're a small church. We're not that big of a church. Our building's not that fantastic. We sit on a corner that you could put two houses on, two city house lots. Winter's coming, maybe. We live in Michigan. Parking gets real challenging. But that isn't stopping us from being on mission. What is God calling us to do? Will he open the door so that we can provide a place that will increase the accessibility for those who come in wheelchairs and disabilities? I pray so. But we're not stopping until that happens. We're gonna serve faithfully until that happens and we'll trust the Lord for it. They were experiencing in this city great opposition. They were experiencing similar conflict to what the church was enduring in Smyrna where Jesus said to them, those of the synagogue of Satan, they say they're Jews, but they're not. They lie. So the synagogue of Satan appears to be a Jewish element that was intensely hateful toward followers of Christ. They opposed Jesus. They opposed his followers, his disciples. They stumbled on Jesus instead of falling on him for repentance. They denied the Christian believers access to the synagogue. No, you can't come in here. And then they spread lies about them in the city. That was their way of giving them opposition. No, you can't come in this this synagogue. Typically, Christians would gather on the Lord's Day. Jewish people would gather on a Sabbath day, on the Saturday, Friday night, Saturday. So it was kind of open and available on a Sunday. I said, no, you can't use this place. And then they began to spread lies about them. And Jesus says, I, I know your works. I know you're small. You're not really making a big splash in the pond here. But I see you. I know you. And I love you. He says this, you've kept my word. You held on to the word of God. Just like I hold on to those stars, those messengers in my hand, you've held on to the word of God. The believers were faithful to the gospel. They were faithful to the teaching of the apostles, even when it put them under great duress. They remained true to the word of Christ, which is the word of God. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, the word of God. In Acts 20 and verse 32, Paul, as he is saying goodbye to those Ephesian elders, Sometime years before this letter was written, he says, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I'm leaving, but I'm leaving you with the word of God, and it is enough. Think about that. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Loved ones, what are you leaving behind in the next generation? If you're not leaving them what Paul left the Ephesian elders, you're leaving them froth. If you are not commending your children to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance, you're giving them nothing. You're giving them air. It's what the whole world pursues. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And if that's what we hand to the next generation, we hand them nothing. That's not what Paul gave them. Philippians 2.16, holding fast the word of life. So that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run or labor in vain. Paul was always using athletic terminology because it's discipline. He says, I'm running. Now, I haven't run in vain, holding fast to the word of life. 2 Timothy 4, 2. So, hey, preacher boy, young man, I'm about to set sail, and you're going to stand up, and you're going to take this baton, Timothy. And every single man of God and person of God afterwards, preach the word. Don't reinvent it. Don't try to repackage it to make it more acceptable in a culture. Whatever the culture is that you live in, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. There's my job description. Wow. Okay, keep praying for me, all right? 
You've kept my word and you have not denied my name. You have not denied my name. You didn't pull what the apostle Peter pulled that night. Aren't, aren't you one of his disciples? Oh, no, 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 I was not me. Yeah, your accent's giving you away. We saw you out there with him. Three times he denies Christ. They, here in Philadelphia, they represented Christ well. As Jesus opened doors for them, they walked through in obedience and faithfulness. And loved ones, that is all he asks of you and of me and of us together. When he opens a door, walk through it. Let's stop making excuses why we aren't going to get in a small group, why we aren't going to serve in a ministry, why you aren't going to be, you know, follow Christ in baptism, why you aren't going to join in and plug in and say, put my DNA in this body. God, use me in this place. What, how many excuses are we going to keep making? That's the praise that comes from Jesus. And you can hear him just, there's just love. There's just love pouring out on them. And now we move to the problem. Here's the deal. There's no problem. According to Jesus, they're ready. They're listening. They're not arrogant. They know they're not perfect. They know they're not sinless. But then Jesus moves right on by the problem and doesn't mention anything. And he goes straight to promises. Verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. Promise, 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 promise. Oh, they would have picked up on it. They would have known. They've heard already enough of the format of the other letters being read. What did Jesus personally commit to these overcomers at Philadelphia that belonged to him, that he loved, they loved him? Promise number one, he says, I will deal with your enemies. Brian's prayer phrase, I got this. Back up. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not. But they lie. Behold, hey, don't miss this. You see how many times he's saying, look, look, catch this. Look at this. I will make them come and bow down before your feet. And they will learn that, you know what they're going to know at the end of the day? I have loved you. They didn't love you. They lied about you. They barred you out of fellowship. I have loved you. They got it wrong. That Jewish opposition, they would one day realize that Jesus of Nazareth, we crucified him and he was buried and he rose again. We, we should have bowed to him. He's the son of man and his son of God. He's Messiah. All will bow before Jesus either in this lifetime as Savior and Lord or in the judgment to come and know him then only as king and judge. The question is not, will you bow to him? And the question is, when will you bow to him? Have you bowed to him? Have you bowed your life? Is he king of your life? And if we're honest, there's areas that need to come under his kingship. All of us. That's what living in community helps us with. Keeps our feet on the ground. Keeps us in authentic relationships. Isaiah 60, 14. The sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you. And all who despised you shall bow down at your feet. They shall call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. You hear the similarity? You hear the resemblance? You hear where this is coming from? Out of Old Testament to New Testament? New Testament, we studied it, Philippians 2.9. Therefore God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name, that's coming up here, the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that, say it with me, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That will be heralded by everyone. The question is when? In this life to know him as Lord and as Savior and King and Friend? Or when you hear the words, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, you small little king of your life that I gave you. You lived a lie. You pretended to be king because you got promoted on your job. You pretended to be king because I gave you athletic talent and ability. You pretended to be king because your parents were wealthy and handed you down a substance. You pretended it was all from you and for you. You small little imposter king. 
bow before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And when we hear that and it opens our eyes in this life, we say, that's true. I don't have anything that he hasn't given to me. He doesn't owe me anything except hell. And instead he gave me Jesus? The best he has to offer? I'll bow to that king because that king won't abuse me like I can be abusive to other people, maybe even just thought. How dare they cut in front of me in traffic? Do you know who I am? You're a nobody like me. And we act like we're little kings and queens everywhere we go. He's the king. He's the righteous king. Oh, Christians... We may be in this lifetime dismissed and despised and rejected, but do you hear what Jesus is saying? You've been loved with an everlasting love. You've been forgiven, received, and adopted by Jesus. Enemies will come and they will bow down before us. Why? Because they will bow down before him. And where are we? With him. In him. And so they'll bow before him and before us. Promise number two. I will keep you from the great tribulation. Here in verse 10, Jesus says, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I will keep you from the great tribulation. And the verb here, to keep. Tereo ek. Okay, it's followed by a preposition from or out of. So I would suggest in there, and you can, you're welcome to, there is so much debate on what does this actually mean, and, and some people view it this way, and that way he's going to keep you through the tribulation, but that's not the word. Now he can, and he will. There will be people come to faith in the tribulation. He'll keep them. Okay, whoever he redeems, he'll keep. But there's something significant going on here to this church that he loves. He's not saying, as a father to a child, I'll just go through Psalm 91, the fire with you. He's saying, I will keep you out of the fire. I will keep you out of it. And that, I believe, supports that the next thing on God's agenda is a rapture of the church. I will keep you out of the great tribulation, not I will keep you through. It's different words. And there, are, there is disagreement on that. I'm just telling you, that's my best understanding. And there it is, all right? It's a little, literal seven years of great tribulation and I believe that this is comforting to the church. And they're like, whew, glad we're not going to be in that. Everything that we're reading and that's coming after this, we're not there, not there, not there. With him, with him, with him. They'll bow before us. They're, we're with him. The people that come to faith in the tribulation, in that time, with the witness going out, the angel, the 144,000, there's going to be great persecution and they will be held and kept. But there's something different going on here to the church. And he says, I'll keep you out of it. Daniel's 70th week, Daniel 9, 24 to 27, just came up in our uh, yearly reading. It's Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 37. The absence of the church is going to be noticeable. All we've been in, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, heaven is the church and heaven, and then suddenly the, ch- the church is just gone from the pages of Revelation for a while. Why? Because there's something happening that the Lord is doing in Israel and on the earth during that great tribulation. This moves into the third promise, and he says, and it kind of folds together with that, I'll keep you out of it, I'm coming soon. I'm coming quickly. So notice this isn't a threat here. He's not saying what he said to the other churches, I'm on the way, you better get your act together. He's saying, I'm coming soon. Okay, when I was engaged to be married, I was ready for the day to get there. Like, why in the world do we have to wait till August Uh, proposed February 13th. Why not just move it up to February 14th? (laughs) Why have to wait? That's what we see going on here. Jesus isn't saying, uh, he's not referring to his final judgment, but being gathered together at him, to him in the coming of Christ, written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and even in our reading today in New City. There's a near and a far fulfillment here. The first coming and his second coming. The first coming, they were waiting on this powerful king to give us our authority back and Jesus came as a small baby and was crucified. He laid down his life. He said, I didn't come to condemn. I came to be condemned so that you can be set free. 
When he comes again, first of all, he will take his church. There's a near and a far fulfillment here, and then he will come, and he will reign, and he will rule. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15, Paul writes to a church that's just so confused, and they've buried their loved ones, and they've experienced the grief, as many of you have, of burying and saying goodbye to loved ones, and we have. He said, Paul writes to them, for this we declare to you by a word from the Lord. I'm not making this up here. This is divine inspiration, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Don't you worry about those. That's terminology for a believer who dies. Sleep in the Lord. For the Lord himself, verse 16, will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with a voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, notice Paul doesn't say future generations after X, Y, Z, and seven other things happen in all these other views, then the Lord will return. Paul views it, he could, I can be part of that number. Jesus can return. Then, so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, frighten one another with these words. Now, why would you, why would you write encouragement? I'm going to drag you through all the judgment. I'll keep you out of it. All our loved ones that have died in Christ. They're asleep. They're with the Lord. Their bodies will be resurrected. Don't, don't you worry about them. We're, we're going to join the Lord in the air. And so we will ever be with the Lord and take this word from God through Paul to a church that was struggling and encourage, comfort one another with these words. Now listen, haven't you been there at times when someone is suffering and grieving and you feel like words are falling very, very far short? And you get tired of saying, I'm so sorry for your loss. You don't have to say that to a believer. You haven't lost anything. Jesus hasn't lost anything. He hasn't lost anyone. A believer can say to a dying believer, I'll see you soon. Goodbye for now. God be with you. Oh, and you're going to be with God. So you aren't losing out. We will miss your fellowship. We will miss your face. We'll miss the hugs. We'll miss all of that. But we are going to miss that forever. Amen? Amen. That's comforting. And these are words. But these aren't words of mere men. This is the word of the living God. And I've been in the situations where people don't have the word of the living God, and it's horrific. It's heartbreaking. When no one has told them this, when this hasn't been set in the prima place of life by a father or a mother or a grandfather or a grandmother, and they have lived as if this is all there is. It's the saddest. It's the saddest situation. And in those moments, we have to fly by the instruments and say, Lord, you, you are the only one that can bring good out of bad, and I trust you. And I don't know about this person that has gone from this life to the next, but you do. So use us to be an encouragement and a help and a comfort to those who are still alive. The church is always held to the belief and been encouraged knowing that Jesus can return. He can interrupt this message fine with me. Okay? If I'm not pleasing the Lord and he's like, actually, go, let's go ahead and do this now. Let's spare these people from this. That's fine with me. Wise, you, 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 nice try. Come on, everybody, let's go. Trumpet, that's fine. But I want you to see the progression in these churches, including next week. Ephesus, Jesus said, I will come to you. If you don't remember, repent, and return, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I, I will come. To Smyrna, no mention of his coming. He says, I have a crown of life for you. It's waiting for you. Pergamus, repent or else I will come to you quickly and I'll fight against them. Thyatira, to the faithful remnant, hey, hold fast what you have till I come. Sardis, I will come upon you as a thief. Here we are in Philadelphia. I will keep you from, I am coming quickly. I'm coming soon. Next week, be 
behold, I stand at the door. I can't even get in what is professing to be my church. I'm here, and you have no time for me. You have no room for me. You have no thought of me. You don't even recognize my voice or me. That's next Sunday. Promise number four, I will honor you. To the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. You have those pillars in mind? All those pillars that they were used to seeing propped up, fall down. Propped up, fall down. Somebody, a great person of a temple, you know, influential in the city, and they put their name on the pillar. You know, so-and-so, Spartacus, donated this pillar, and that pillar fell down. We aren't etching anybody's name. We build a building, nobody's name is getting etched in anything. There's one name. His name is Jesus. May we live to the honor and glory and praise of him. To the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never gonna have an earthquake hit it. The temple of my God, it'll stay. Never shall he go out of it. You're hearing the tremor, grab your kids, moms, dads, come on, get out of here, get out of here. And Jesus is saying, when you're in my house, you're never gonna have to run anywhere because there's nothing gonna shake my house. You're nothing gonna shake my kingdom. You're safe. I got you. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. You've seen all these little gods all around you and all their stuff falls flat. And Jesus is saying, not true of the God of heaven. And uh, the apostles, they piped up, oh, Jesus, uh, what about us? We've left stuff. What, what, what do we have? Luke 18, 29, he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. There's a whole lot more coming than what you have given up, what I've given up. So what does the Lord promise to them? He says, oh, I will honor you. You're gonna have an exalted position and you will have a new belonging. An exalted position is a pillar in the temple of my God. Those pillars, they'd fall down all the time. Christ, he says, all those earthly awards and honors, they all have a brief shelf life. But when I honor you and I exalt you, there's never ending honor there. It's joy forevermore. We are part of a temple now. He lives in us by his spirit. We're a temple. As a church, we're a temple. He's building his church. Psalm 147, verse six, the Lord lifts up the humble and he casts the wicked to the ground. So Peter says, 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you when he sees fit. Let him exalt you. But the way to be exalted is to humble yourself. An exalted position is what he promises and a new belonging. He says, here's what I have for you. You you live in the city of brotherly love and there's people in there that are not too loving, all right? Our city, Philadelphia, all right? Crime rate, statistics, not so good. The homeless population, the drug problem in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is not good. It's not living up to his name. Jesus is saying to these people, you're living in a really tough situation, but I have a new belonging for you. I will write on you the name of my God. We're secure in Christ. Jesus says, I'll give you my own new name. What happens in a wedding? The bride takes the name of the, of the husband, of the groom. And Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm going to give you my name. You're mine. This is how he's been speaking to this church. Like, I'm, I love you. I came for you. I died for you. I gave up everything for you to have you. I love you. I'm going to give you my name. I'm going to clothe you in white. I will do all of this for you. I have prepared a place for you. That's what a groom does for a bride. That's what Jesus, you hear the intimacy here. It'll all take place in the New Jerusalem. Listen, when weddings happen, I always love the, the part when the, the new bride has to write for the first time if she hasn't practiced the new name, 
right? And don't get it wrong. We just got this official document here, and I'm, I'm looking at some recent brides here, and it's always serious, and I have to tell everybody, stop talking to them. Stop talking to them. They have to write a new name. And sometimes, you know, the bride is like, oh, boy, hang on, let me practice a little bit this new name. Don't forget that. That's what Jesus says about his own people. You're mine. And I loved you. Now he gives a prompt. He gives a prompt. He says, here, I want you to do this. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. I don't want anyone to cause you to lose your reward. I don't want you to take your eye off the ball. What's at stake for a believer, for a child of God? We can't lose our salvation, but we can lose our testimony. We can lose our reward. So Jesus is saying, hey, caution here. You've done well. I love you, but remain faithful. Semper Fi. Stay faithful. Remain always faithful. Why? Don't let someone come in and shortchange you. Oh, here's this thing over here you can do. Here's this thing over there. What about this? What about this idea? What about this new teaching? Don't let anybody take your eye off me. Keep your your eye on Jesus. Oh, that we will keep our eyes on Jesus. And then he gets to the conclusion. And the church would have said, wait a second. He didn't say anything negative to us. He didn't say anything that we got to stop this, quit that, knock that off, fix this, repent of that. Anybody have ears to hear? He who has an, ear, has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you hear with ears? Can you hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches through Jesus? Well, how do I know, Pastor, if I have ears to hear? How committed are you to obeying? If you have ears to hear what Jesus is saying, then that's that last line. The evidence will be seen in your will to obey. That's how you have, no. Do I have ears to hear? Well, do I want to obey? And then it's a little stronger than do I want to obey is do I obey? Do I reorder my life to obey my king or do I simply in one ear and out the other, I heard it, but uh, parents say, but you didn't hear me. Oh, I heard you. No, 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 because nothing changed. You didn't hear me. I said, fill in the blank. That's what we know. If my life is reordered moment by moment, day by day, Sunday by Sunday, small group by small group, relationship by relationship, that's how my life is coming under the kingship of Christ day by day, moment by moment. How about you? What needs to change in your life? to be on mission, the great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ so that our lives will reflect his glory, his goodness, his grace, and all people around us will see Christ in us and they will bow down before him before it's too late. And maybe for you, that's today. That's now. Will you stand with me? Worship team, you come. Kevin and Kristen, you're being baptized. I want you to come at this time, those who are helping. You make your way. uh, Kevin, you'll go up to your left. Kristen, you go up to your right. If we all get up on the same side, we can separate, no problem. Being baptized today is is just wonderful. If you are wanting to follow the Lord in baptism, then as uh, was said earlier, talk to us. Let us help you take that step. Father, I thank you, oh, I thank you for Jesus. Jesus, you are the greatest of all, and you are our King and our Savior. And I thank you that today, as this gospel goes forward, there might be someone, and I would trust that whoever is hearing that has not repented and trusted in you yet, that today would be the day of their salvation, that they would confess you as Lord. They would confess their sin, and admit, I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior, and they would find you to be their Savior. Father, help us to be on mission. Help us, Lord, to not put our own agendas in front of your great commission. Not today, not this week, not this year, not ever. And we need one another to encourage us in that, because easily 
the main thing can become a secondary thing. And Lord, forgive us of any way that we're doing that. May we live to the honor and glory of Jesus. For if we have you, we have everything. And if we don't have you, as I fear some may be in that condition this morning, they actually have from eternity nothing. But you are available to them and to us right now. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for listening to Teaching from the Word at Grace Community Church. We are located in Richmond, Michigan. You can find us online at mygracechurch.com. Please subscribe and follow us at My Grace Church. It would be greatly appreciated if you would take a moment to rate, like, and share this message. We want you to always remember that you are loved.